This week, we'll cover two topics, ethics of information, so copyright and plagiarism, and methods to collect and manage information. So let's start today off with a question. How many copyrights do you think you own? None, one, 10, 20, 100, 1,000? To get to the answer, we have to look into copyright just a little bit. Copyright is defined as the legal right to use, distribute, and sell or give away a creative work. This is not a very helpful definition on its own, but it does give us some foundation for what copyright covers, creative work. Let's dig a little deeper. Anything that is fixed in any tangible medium of expression has copyright protection under the law in the United States. Photographs, drawings, books, articles, CD-ROMs, software code, blog posts, emails, etc. all fall under that guideline. Under current copyright law, the creator of any work automatically owns copyright to that work as soon as they fix it, meaning write it down electronically, on paper, or in some other medium. So this helps us quite a bit. Copyright covers anything that is fixed in any tangible medium of expression. This means if it is something that exists in space and other people can perceive it or work with it, it is a work that has copyright protection. There are certain things that are excluded from copyright under U.S. law, like ideas or things that can't take a tangible form, but we're not going to cover that or get into that today. Finally, one more aspect of copyright to recognize. One does not have to register their work with the U.S. Copyright Office in order to receive copyright protection. However, registering one's work provides benefits for people who make commercial use of their works. For instance, if you're going to license a composition for use in a movie, or those who anticipate suing for copyright infringement. So, this last point says, you don't need to register your work to have copyright over it. So anything you've made tangible, your notes for class, a blog post, doodles, papers you've written, you have copyright over. You, in fact, have thousands of copyrights. Now, say someone finds something you've written and they modify it or use it in some meaningful way. And after they do that, they attribute you with appropriate credit. That's so awesome! They're providing you with credit for something you've worked on, and that is citing. Citing is so important for so many reasons, especially in academia and research. In research, how many cites a paper has can often demonstrate the impact of a work, though that doesn't necessarily relate to the importance of a work. This can be hard to detangle, it's a little bit strange to think about, but think about a paper that proposes an interesting or revolutionary concept, but no one can find it. It's an important paper, but it doesn't have very high impact yet, it doesn't have as many citations yet. Another interesting example to note is when a paper has been retracted. This means that the paper, originally published, has been found to be incorrect in some way, and it is retracted or withdrawn from the journal it was originally published in. This is not because people are malicious or because research in science is bad. It's, again, that researchers are indeed human, and they make mistakes sometimes. But the beauty of science is that it is self-correcting over time. This means that science is better and stronger with our failures and our successes, which is why I encourage both. So, thinking back to the retracted paper, sometimes these papers have many citations, but they're no longer relevant. Why? It could partially be because people are talking about the retraction itself and maybe the impact that that retraction has had on science, not necessarily the conclusions of the paper. That's why citations are so important, but they aren't an automatic indication of the success or importance of a paper. Now, say someone finds something you've written or that you've made and they use it in some meaningful or successful way and they don't attribute you with credit. How would you feel? I can imagine someone who has their ideas taken from them feeling very angry, very frustrated, and very sad. Someone else is getting credit for their work, or someone else is getting credit for my work. The work that I put time and effort into, and now someone else is benefiting from that. So that's why we cite, and that's also why plagiarism carries such a heavy weight. It's unethical to take ideas of others and claim them as your own. 
citing demonstrates that you're using the work of others and that you're growing and that you are a respectful member of a community. You'd want others to respect the intellectual sweat you put into your work, so make sure you're respectful of the work of others. And what if you've unintentionally plagiarized? You can still have negative repercussions. This is not a situation where your ignorance gives you a pass. It's important to review the academic policy of whatever institution you are affiliated with. So how can you avoid plagiarizing someone else's work? The best thing you can do is manage the information that you gather. Keeping track of your citations isn't a scary thing, and you have a lot of tools to help you be successful, but it does take work. There are many methods for keeping track of your work. Number one, citation managers. These can help you keep track of what you found and where you found it. Some even allow you to take notes about the things that you find. So take advantage of citation managers. A quick reminder, citation managers, like most pieces of technology, are pretty good at their job, but they're neither perfect nor magical. So you should always double check your citations or the information that is coming out of citation managers for accuracy. I'd hate for you to use a citation manager, expect it to magically grab everything perfectly every time, and then get docked points on an assignment in a future class. Number two is writing an annotated bibliography. This is a great way to contextualize the information that you find, plus you'll include important snippets of why this information is important, easily giving you some extra information to work with. Spreadsheets are yet another way to organize information. There are great ways to categorize information with spreadsheets and automatic ways to organize or search information that you put into your spreadsheet, but spreadsheets might have a bit of a learning curve or you might need to do a bit of work at the very beginning of your project to get them working smoothly. So this isn't an easy solution, but it can be very effective at organizing information. Index cards, of course, are a great way to organize too. It's a great way to practice paraphrasing. You can visually organize your index cards to see where you have a lot of information or where you have sections where you need more information. A final way to organize your information is to color code it. This can be added to many of the previous information management schemas that we've just discussed. Um, make sure you use a predetermined color coding scheme to organize your work. How you organize is up to you. Maybe you organize by theme or by section or by what role the source plays in your work. It's up to you. Just make sure you're consistent. These are just a few suggestions for how you might go about managing information. Maybe you've already found a method that works really well for you, and if so, stick with it. As always, your research process is totally unique to you. If you haven't found something you're happy with, try out different techniques. Um, eventually, you will find something that works for you. You can also talk to others to see what they suggest. To wrap up, we've touched on copyright, ethics of information use, and managing the information that you gather. I do hope you've come away with a few ideas on how to manage your information and you recognize how important this process is. So that's it for this week. As always, happy citing and happy searching.